Hi everyone, it's our last week of videos uh, for our Chem 7020 class. Uh, and this week we're just going to talk about something maybe a little bit different. We've been talking a lot about research ethics. Uh, and the first part about this is going to be somewhat similar, and the second part is going to be a little bit different. But we've been talking a lot about not faking data, conflict of interest, that kind of thing. And I wanted to end on this idea of biases uh, that we have, uh, because a lot of times there are times when people obviously do something wrong. They change a data point. They openly, you know, uh, accept a bribe or something like that there's a lot of times when it's a lot more subtle and that's what I feel like this last week is about when things kind of subtly get in your way of using your best judgment in science what can happen so we're going to look at biases tonight and the first type of bias we're going to look at are publishing kind of things so this is back to some of the same things we've been talking about um, but this is where you're having biases perhaps towards uh, what happens why are things sometimes wrong uh, biased in publishing. Um, why, why do we sometimes get it wrong? Why are studies published that have the wrong results? Or why do we allow them through peer review? That kind of thing. So this is uh, from a PNAS paper, actually from a, um, yeah, a PNAS paper um, about potential sources of bias in publishing. And the first potential source is just a small study effect. That if you have a small study size, like the number of subjects that you look at, and perhaps low precision, you might find effect sizes, i.e. larger effects than you might otherwise see. And so what happens sometimes is somebody does a small study, right, and they present an effect, and people go, ooh, there must be an effect, and when they kind of replicate that in a larger, uh, more controlled study, you don't always see it. Um, that's actually the decline effect, which I just described there. Uh, I think we're seeing this right now in the coronavirus thing, right? There are 20,000 little tiny studies out about this drug or that drug, right? And they're going to work for the coronavirus. And then the real scientists keep saying, but we need to do them on a larger scale, right? We can't just trumpet that they're all going to work uh, because there's this idea that if we do them in a really controlled way on a larger scale, we're afraid we won't see it, right? Where a lot of these initial studies, well, we looked at 20 patients here or 30 patients there, right, uh, for all of these drug effects. Uh, and so, um, you know, they, they, you have, it's not that there's necessarily were wrong or that they did anything wrong in those first studies, uh, but that seeing a small size, uh, studying a small size doesn't always lead right to the correct answer. All right, so the second one is that what they call the gray literature bias. I have to admit, I didn't know this term before, although I do know this effect. And that is that you only publish things that work, right? And there's a big bias in science towards things that are published that work. Uh, and so what they say, the gray literature then, are things that are not significant or maybe really small, might only be hidden in PhD theses. I like that, right? You know, you wrote it up in your thesis, but you never published it. Conference proceedings, books, or personal communications, right? So, you know, nobody gets their nature paper from writing up something that didn't work. Um, you know, unless it was really supposed to work or something like that. So there's this bias, right, that stuff is supposed to work, and when it doesn't work, we don't publish it. And that's a big problem because probably people spend a lot of effort in science repeating things that other people know don't work, but they never tried. On the other hand, occasionally people will try something that somebody else tried that didn't work, and maybe they'll get it to work. So, um, But I think that's a smaller, a smaller bit. And then the decline effect is right, like the earliest studies show this big effect, and then when they're repeated and done more carefully and we try and fill in what are the conditions it works under, et cetera, et cetera, we tend to see less effect as it goes on in time. Uh, as I said, and I'm afraid we're going to see a little bit of that in some of these coronavirus things that are coming up. All right, um, the other sources of virus uh, is that early extreme. So if you can find some sort of extreme or controversial finding, right? You have this early window to publish it, right? So it doesn't always pay to really look into it. Instead, you're like, oh my God, this drug is going to, you know, solve the world so I can publish it with 20 people and, you know, get my science paper kind of thing, right? Um, and so people have this kind of bias and this push to maybe publish something early and controversial because they know they can get a big paper out of it rather than maybe spending more time to really figure it out. Uh, the citation bias, uh, so we tend to cite the things that have the bigger effect as if those must be the right studies, right? So if there's, you know, something that claims a small effect and something that claims a big effect, you know, even if they're maybe claiming opposite effects, 
we still tend to believe the one that's bigger, even though that may not be true. And then I thought this was funny. Um, I didn't realize this effect, but the U.S. effect. That apparently, the publications from authors working in the U.S., uh, the United States, might overestimate effect sizes. Um, and I don't know. Uh, they were saying one or two studies has found this. I don't know. Um, I do think that so that, that there is sometimes a bias, though. Um, I definitely know there's a bias towards studies that are done in certain countries, right? So you'll look at the authors, and if the authors are from certain countries, typically places like the U.S., you go, oh, well, that must be a good study. And then if they're done from a country that's maybe more of a developing world country or a country you don't understand or trust as much, maybe you say, well, I don't know about that country, and you don't trust the data as much. So there's definitely an effect of location. I don't know whether us people in the U.S. are uh, doing that or not. And then industry bias. Um, that again, we talked about this a little bit with conflict of interest, but industry sponsorship might affect the direction and magnitude of the effect uh, that, you know, they push people to find an effect uh, for their drug or for their medical device, that kind of thing. Okay, so why do these things exist then? So those are all ones that people have found in the literature, um, uh, biases that are kind of known to exist. What are the factors behind them? Well, there's that big pressure to publish, right? Uh, so you might be more likely to want to exaggerate the magnitude and importance of the result to get a high-impact publication or a new grant, right? I mean, that's just life, right? The pressure's there. Publish or perish is real, especially if you're in academia. Uh, and so, you know, people are more likely to pick, cherry-pick the results that worked, right? Uh, it's just what happens. Uh, and then there's the pressure to publish that's induced by national policies. Um, that connect publication with career advancement and public funding. Uh, some of these are more explicit than others. I mean, I think in the U.S. we definitely, obviously if you want a grant or an award, right, you know, you've got to have published some good papers even to get an academic job. Uh, but there are some countries that literally give bonuses of like $20,000 in your paycheck if you get a science paper or if you, you know, you need certain things to land certain grants. And of course, with that comes the publish, the, you know, the real pressure to publish to get the kinds of results that are going to go to those sorts of papers. Um, there's also this idea of collaborations. Uh, and strangely enough, they find that if you closely collaborate with somebody, particularly if they're at your same institution, sometimes you can mutually control each other's work and increase integrity, right? You know, if you're really like maybe meeting weekly and looking through the data, right, you're less likely to try and fudge some numbers or do something like that. Strange enough, it goes the other way, though, if people are really distant collaborators, right? So if I collect some data and I just send it across the country to a collaborator, right? Um, we maybe talk about it once or twice and they put it in the paper. That actually tends to make studies less, have less integrity because there's not much um, uh, collaboration and not much kind of feedback there. Uh, so. Uh, the more that people are working closely together, the more people working closely together, usually the better it is for having less bias in the paper. All right, and then other factors that are in biases are early career researchers. Uh, and so they find that they typically have seen more biases in papers by early career researchers with the idea that they are either maybe less experienced and don't know what they should be doing or they might have more to gain from taking risks. Like, oh my gosh, I've got to have that paper for tenure. Okay, I'm going to risk it and put some bias in or not include all the results or that kind of thing. Uh, the other sociological factors that have been um, they, that, that males are more likely to commit scientific fraud. Uh, again, um, this all comes from that same PNS paper that I had the, um, the citation for on a previous slide. Uh, that they're more likely to take risks. And so the biases are um, more likely. And then individual integrity. I really liked this one <laughs> because I think all of us can probably look at a scientist or two and go, oh my gosh, they really have a huge ego, right? So you think narcissism and other psychopathologies, right? Underlying misbehavior and unethical decision making, right? That some people just are really full of themselves. And they think whatever they do must be right and that they are special, right? And that they have the right to kind of manipulate things or do whatever they want. Uh, and that would, it's okay because it's them, right? And they are special and they can do it. Um, and so nobody is like that, but I think everybody kind of knows a scientist that 
that kind of teeters on the edge of that. <laughs> I hate to say it. Uh, it's easier to see it always in other people than yourself, though. So before you go going, well, yeah, that's that. This person's problem. Uh, you ought to look in the mirror and go, but am I sometimes a little narcissistic thinking, yeah, well, maybe somebody else shouldn't do that with the data, but it's okay because I'm, I'm a I'm a good person. I, I know I wouldn't cheat uh, kind of thing. So, um, but yeah, there, there are times when people definitely get on their own bandwagon and think whatever they do must be fine. So how do we fight publication bias then? Um, the first one, is, of course, is to recognize the biases exist. So that's why I threw a big long list of them and to try and correct maybe for some sociological factors. There's been a lot of experiments in blind review. Um, should you review papers without looking at who the authors are? Should you review grants without looking at who the authors are? They do tend to find that they have less bias it's really hard to do because most of the time when you write a paper, you refer back to your other papers. It's pretty easy to guess who wrote the paper, right? We're, the Renton Lab often works in tiny little fields that we're like the only people doing it. You would know it was us. Um, and so it's, it's not as easy to do as you think, even though in big fields, it does help. Um, but a lot of it is to be proactive, that journals and other people should be inviting diverse groups of people to apply to publish, apply for awards, and apply for grants, um, again, uh, and keeping a good sense of what collaborators are doing, especially distant collaborators. The more you really talk about projects, the more you'll find out that you understand that. And then a lot of the problems have to do with small end numbers and effect sizes that are too good to be true. Wow, that's a huge effect considering they only looked at eight subjects, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and so I think that's why the scientists, again, are so reticent to endorse any coronavirus drug at the moment. Uh, they know all the studies are small, not well controlled, and have small effect sizes. And that doesn't mean they shouldn't necessarily be published, but people are weary of them, whereas people with less of a scientific background um, are more likely, I think, to jump on the bandwagon. Uh, so this is one of these cases where maybe you can use your uh, knowledge of publication bias and effect sizes to uh, kind of help educate the public at this time of like, you know, just because a small study finds that often that means it's not repeated uh, as we go on in life. Um, and so that's why we often have to have a lot of replication, right? A lot of other studies uh, looking at things because oftentimes, especially those of you who want to go into drug discovery, right? If you're going to test out a drug, the problem is you don't just test a drug once, right? You test it in a variety of conditions. Who do we give this drug to, right? Do we give it to really sick people? Do we give it to people just developing the coronavirus, for an example? Uh, you know, how many days do we give it? What dose? How many, you know, what method? IV or by pill? Um, I mean, there's so many variables, right? So each study looks at just a subsection of these variables, right? And we need a bunch of studies to really fill it in and understand what a drug's going to do. And that's just one example, uh, but it's the one in the news right now. Um, and so we should be thinking about drugs and effect sizes and that kind of thing. Okay, so that's publication bias. Um, and again, we talked about some of those issues before. The last thing I wanted to talk about, though, is more um, uh, gender, disability, um, uh, racial uh, kind of biases. And there's a lot of studies going on now and a lot of ed education about what they call implicit biases, right? And so it's not that we all... Uh, mean to be gender biased or mean to be racially biased, right? But that we just have these implicit biases in ourselves. So I don't know if you've ever taken one of these implicit bias tests. There's, there's a bunch of them. Um, this is a study, uh, again, a, nature, a neuron paper, sorry, that I'm studying, um, citing on the bottom there. But there's a Harvard test, but there's some of these other ones. And we have to associate words with either different genders or different races. Um, and so when they show you science words and they tell you, you know, you should make the science words, you know, you should click on the key that means female, like an F for female, you, you're slower to be able to do that with science words than you were when they tell you, okay, now put a female every time you see a word that has to do with the humanities or the family. Um, both men and women are slower at this. It isn't that the women are so great at making all the women into scientists. Uh, it's just that we're like been intrinsically trained to think that females should be associated with the humanities and family. And so we have these implicit biases. And what they end up looking like in STEM is that over time they grow, um, they grow up. So they've done these studies where they ask children to, pre the, to draw a scientist. And at age six, 
about half of the girl, over half the girls draw female scientists, right? Not as many of the boys, but you know, like that, that you know, 40, 50%, 40% of the kids or something will draw a female, and many of the girls will. At 10, the boys, almost no boy, draws a female scientist, right? And about half the girls do. And by 16, almost everyone, if you ask them to draw a scientist, draws a male. So it's pretty depressing, right? That, you know, that the kids over time get this idea that all of the scientists are male. Um, there's ways to combat this, though, is to actually know a female scientist. I'm kind of proud that uh, my kid's teacher made him do this about a year ago. I have a, an 11 year old now, so maybe he did it when he was nine or 10. And he drew something and I was like, well, what did you draw? And he's like, well, I don't draw very well, mommy. I can't draw people, you know, give me a long, I'm like, yeah, but who did you draw? Like, what did you draw? And he's like, mommy, I drew you, right? <laughs> and I was like, my husband's not a scientist, right? You know, so if they know a woman scientist, it's like, well, obviously this only scientist in his life is me, uh, right? You know, so that's who he would draw. He was, it was like, duh, mommy, that's the only one I would draw, right? But they don't, if you don't see it, you don't draw it. Um, and then it comes, as I said, in underrepresentation as well. So panel B here says women are underrepresented as last authors. Um, so those are the senior authors, right? And it's a little depressing because you look like first authors. Um, I believe this is a neuroscience study. So let's think that this is neuroscience papers, not necessarily chemistry. But in neuroscience, um, that the women in, six, in the 2016, they almost are 50% when they can assign a gender to the first author. There's a lot of women in neuroscience. All authors is 40%, and then last authors is like 29%. So you see that they're not getting to those faculty positions. And then they're like, okay, you know, what are the number of years so we could get to general pa gender parity for first authors? It's like one or two years, right? And we should be there. For all authors, it's like 15, and for last authors, it's like 45. Um, it's a little bit sad um, as far as that goes. Um, they've found intrinsically that having female conference organizers means that there are generally more female speakers. Um, and that if you see down here, the percentage of female speakers uh, kind of levels off at 60%. But, you know, that uh, just having people on the organizing committee, mainly because they usually know other good women, um, you know, helps. But when the organizing committee is largely male, the number of female speakers is usually tiny. Uh, and then this is... Um, STEM PhD student paper sub submissions. Um, and so um, you can see that underrepresented minorities um, typically have fewer papers um, than uh, non underrepresented minorities, and the men have more than the women. Uh, and so again, there's just these biases that kind of grow up and then all of a sudden, you know, you're one or two papers behind in graduate school. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but it's huge, right? If you only publish three or four. Uh, and it goes on to then make, make people not have the right resume, so then they don't get hired, et cetera, et cetera. So um, here are some of the areas that are known that implicit biases affect. There's a lot of literature out there that letters of recommendation are terribly gender biased and probably minority biased too. Um, no, not just probably, they are. Um, so women tend to get, people tend to use adjectives to describe them as like hardworking, or they'll give a story about how they organized everything in the lab or something, right? So it's about how they kept up the lab, but not how they did science. Where men tend to have adjectives that describe them as like brilliant, um, you know, as their work is being extremely novel or innovative or that kind of thing. And so you get the idea that the guys are really smart and the girls aren't really smart, right? They're just hardworking. Um, and then the same thing, blacks are far likely to get be described as like competent. And you think, well, competent's good. No, it's not. You don't want someone that's competent. You want someone that's excellent. You want someone that's a standout, right? You know, the best in the lab kind of thing. Uh, you know, those are what letters of recognition are usually peppered with. And so when, you know, people are describing minorities as competent, it's really offensive and it's not particularly helpful. Um, implicit bias also affects grants, merit increases, hiring, awards, and papers in prestigious journals. Uh, a lot of times the problem is that when you look at resumes, et cetera, et cetera, they'll, they'll show that if they put a male name on it, people are far more likely to put the, think the person uh, should get the job than if they put like a female name on it. Same if they put like a white sounding name on a resume compared to a 
black or African-American sounding name. And a lot of times it's just who we give the credit to. It's like a lot of times if there's is like, oh, I look at a resume and I see some great, um, great accomplishment. Do I say, wow, that must be evidence that this person is really a genius? Or do I say, huh, I think they probably just got lucky, right? Maybe they just happened to find that result. Or, you know, if it's a multi-author paper, maybe there's an African-American first author. And you say, well, they just got all, they just, you know, it's all about their PI's effort, right? They didn't really do anything to get that first author paper, uh, et cetera, et cetera. When there's collaborations, uh, do you give the cre all the credit for the collaboration to the woman collaborator or to the male collaborator, et cetera, et cetera? So oftentimes we, these biases make us think that we're being very meritorious. Well, I'm looking at these very meritorious and I'm looking at them very fair. And the reality is you're not because you're implicitly giving the credit to the man instead of the woman or the white person instead of the African-American person. Uh, and so there's been a lot of studies uh, that these sort of things happen. Um, there's also a lot of differences in expectations, right? Uh, in the workplace, women are also expected to be nice or motherly or friendly. And if this isn't your image, if you're looking hard charging or too, you know, um, into your own project or something like that, then people don't like you, right? You know, you're not a nice person. Whereas men are often allowed to be a lot more selfish, aggressive, and individualistic. Right, women are supposed to be community oriented, making sure everybody is succeeding. Whereas if we look at a man, especially in science, and they don't care about anybody else except their own research, we're really understanding of that. Well, they have to look out for themselves, right? They've got to go after their own grants. They don't have time to do any service, right? We'll push that all off on the women because they should be building community. Um, and then what happens is that, and I see this happen again and again, quite frankly, is that the women then come up short in like the number of publications or that, et cetera, et cetera, and then are punished for grants or awards, whereas the men were let off scot-free, not having to do a lot of service. Thus, when it comes time for awards that they've got more publications, they look better on paper, right? Uh, and the things that we quote value uh, for awards or grants, uh, they look better at. Minorities are often downplayed as well and expectations as only being there to fill a quota or that they aren't competent, right? They're, they're just there to fill a quota, so they're obviously not competent. Um, the other thing for expectations that you really have to worry about is minorities are often thought to represent an entire race or group of people. Like, you know, I happen to be a white person and what I think does not represent all white people. Uh, and so there's no way that we should expect that any one person, just because they may be the only person that we know from a racial or ethnic group, is there to represent their whole race or ethnicity, uh, that kind of thing. Minorities also tend to get a lot of service work dumped on them. And again, it's not the prestigious service work of like leading a committee that everybody knows about. It's the, again, helping and mentoring uh, struggling students, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that tends to get overlooked, especially in academia. However, there's been a showing that there's a lot of benefits to having diversity, to having different groups of people. Different ways of thinking usually lead to very different solutions. And in fact, they've shown that if you have different types of people, it leads to more conflict. But more conflict as a consequence of diversity leads to more innovation, right? So when somebody questions, why do we do it that way? I think we should do it this way when, you know, people don't all come from the same background they often can think of different solutions. This actually happens in science too. I think sometimes we have a bias in science to only hire people in academia from a few small groups of people, right, who are the best scientists, you know, we gotta hire that professor from Harvard or whatever. And then what you find is that you've got, a, you know, 20 people who came out of this leading lab that all do very similar kind of cookie cutter science. And sometimes if you hire somebody that comes out of a different lab, maybe it doesn't look as prestigious, but they come with a different skill set or background and they can attack a problem in a different way. Uh, so there's a danger to thinking that, you know, there's only one right lab or one right way of doing things. The other benefit of diversity is that students can often see someone's like that, themselves as a role model. Um, and in academia, we think a lot about this, but even in industry. Um, Again, you want people to be able to identify and work well with other people, uh, and seeing somebody that look, looks like themselves is one of the biggest factors. In fact, this last one is one of the reasons I work with the, I worked for years with the group LEAD, which is our kind of outreach group that goes out to schools, and I really encourage people to get involved, all types of people, because I think one of the best things about going out to school with a different scientist is we brought out a bunch of people and they all look different, right?
uh, you know, they're not all the same race. They're men, women, um, different types of people. And I think if people can see themselves, students can see someone like that, it's often uh, can be a good role model. Okay, so fighting implicit bias, what do we do? I have to admit that I don't think there's always that many good solutions out there, but this is what the papers say. The first one is to know it exists and question your assumptions in evaluating people. A lot of times in evaluating people, you maybe need to get off the one or two criteria that everybody thinks are important. Well, the number of papers and think about what else do we think is important? How about creativity or building community or things that, again, that uh, certain groups might be really good at or be pushed into, but we don't always look at as a value, a valuable thing. Um, it's always important to share responsibility and define individual roles uh, that, um, again, that um, to not just, uh, again, assume that people will um, do certain things. Well, the woman in the room, I can't stand it when they ask the woman in the room to take notes, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Like everybody should be acting as the secretary, right, in a meeting or everybody should be acting, um, you know, in different roles and you can kind of champion that. Um, project actively working to champion people who are undervalued, right? Um, if you see things, if you get to be a part, again, you're not a manager yet. I know you're a first year graduate student, uh, but at some point in time, you're going to hopefully be a manager where you can work to champion people and show people what their accomplishments are and how they're helping an organization, even if those aren't the things that are traditionally valued. Um, you can avoid casual bias to treat people equally. Um, one of the examples of this is just using the same professional title for everyone. You'll see people sometimes on social media press, you know, that they, women and other minorities get annoyed when it's like, dear Dr. Smith, Dr. Jones, and Jill. You know, and Dr. Smith and Dr. Jones are both male, and Jill is the woman, right? It's like, wait, I am Dr. Venton, right? You can use my name, too. Um, and so I have to admit that I uh, tell a story where they put up signs, um, and I won't say who does it, I, who, whoever designed them doesn't work in the department anymore. This was several years ago, to show people whose offices were in the new chemistry wing, like the new edition. And they said, Professor this, Professor that, Professor this. And when they got to uh, Professor Dubay, right, it didn't say Professor, it said Doctor. And I went to the person and I threw a fit. And I said, no, because the only other person who was listed as doctor was um, Hunt's lab manager, who's not a professor. And I said, you know, she wasn't given the same honorific title that everybody else was. The only woman on the sign and her title was different. And they're like, well, it's not a big deal. I mean, she is a doctor. And I was like, yes, but everybody else was given the honorific professor and she needs the same honorific. And so they did remake the signs, but it's just one of those things where people couldn't even understand what the big deal was. What are you complaining about? Like, and it's like, well, sorry, professor in this case is a higher honorific than doctor and everybody should be given the same title. And then the last thing is kind of mentorship and advocacy. Um, that it would be nice if everybody could do this on their own, but sometimes you have to realize it. There was a study and I found this amazing that found that high achieving male faculty prestigious grants like HHMI or they were a national academy member tended to train fewer women uh, and so it's like the big guys are only training guys right and then who do you want to hire well you want to hire the person who worked for an HHMI or a national academy member right oh well gosh there were no women in the pool oh well right you know and so we need to fight this at all levels right to fight that have everybody you know, training both women and men and minorities and that kind of thing. It's not the job of only women to train women, right, or minorities to train minorities. That's a horrible way um, of having science go forward. Um, but we need everybody to be mentoring and advocating for all people in science. And then there's the last slide of what not to do, um, treating diversity as a checkbox, right? Um, we have our one minority speaker at a conference, right? We have our one person in the department who thinks about diversity that kind of thing. We need a more group and inclusive that everybody's thinking about this. The other thing is to put the onus on whatever the underrepresented is group to not prove themselves. Oftentimes you hear people give excuses for things like, well, women don't want to speak at conferences because they have young children. It's like, well, did you invite them? Well, no, right? You didn't invite them. You invited all your male buddies. And then your you know, excuse for why there weren't any women is because women don't like to go to conferences um, you know, with disabled people rather than asking maybe if they need any assistance or going out of your way to make sure that they have what they need to be able to do their job. You're like, well, they wouldn't want any assistance, right? They would want to prove it all by themselves. Um, and so again and again, you see 
kind of the onus being shoved back on people. It's like, well, if they really wanted that, they would prove it themselves. And they don't get the, again, they don't get the invitations to the fight conferences. They don't get the invitations to the, you know, top journals, et cetera, et cetera. And so you really need to um, avoid that as much as possible. And then the other thing is to break hiring rules of federal law. Um, a lot of times this is couched in, well, I can't do that to advocate a person because I'm just trying to hire the best person and I'm not going to discriminate, et cetera, et cetera. And it's true you're not allowed to pick a hiring, doing hiring based on race, so, but you can always examine what your criteria are um, and that kind of thing. And far more often people bend the rules, quite frankly to hire somebody of the majority, somebody that looks like them, then they bend the rules to hire the minority. But they almost always use an excuse as like, well, we can't possibly do that. Can't look at minorities any differently, right? You know, so that way we have to go back uh, to the, you know, majority person because that's the person we're most comfortable with. Um, and so, no, you don't want to break any hiring rules or federal laws, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but a lot of times that also just becomes an excuse. So this is not going to make you an, ex an expert in implicit bias, but I do think we needed to talk about diversity and implicit bias because I think that as we, um, that, that again, science is better when we utilize the talents of everybody, the diverse population that we have in this country and around the world. We have a lot of international students too. Uh, and so I'm hoping that as we go along, we hope this every generation, I don't know that it really turns out to be true, that, that again, that we will have better and more advocates uh, for diversity and again, all people being able to do science as we go along. Okay, well, I thank you for watching this video and all the class videos. There are um, case studies up as well. This is the last week of case studies, uh, so there won't be any case studies posted after this. Uh, and thanks, and I'm sorry we didn't get to meet in class and after a spring break, uh, but I hope you learned a little bit from these videos and watching the doing the case studies. Thanks, everyone.